Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I mean, speakers usually start off with, uh, it's really an honor to be here, blah, blah, blah. But it really is an honor. <laughs> I mean this. I mean it. No, I re it really is an honor both to be at the University of Waterloo, which, which I'm just learning to pronounce today. I've been saying Waterloo, and it's Waterloo, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but it's really an honor to be here. That, that already would be an honor, but to be the Rudrick visiting speaker this year um, is particularly an honor. And you know, I've only been here for a couple days and have really enjoyed the warm, very Canadian welcome that I've received uh, from, from people, so I appreciate that. I, I, I live in Detroit, and my, my new office doesn't have the same view as, as when I was in the philosophy department, but when I was in the philosophy department, I could see Canada from my office. <laughs> which I thought made me an expert in far foreign policy. But I'm not, here, I'm not here to speak about foreign policy. I am actually here to speak about sexual orientation discrimination and the metaphysics of cakes. And the title is partly just because I thought it would be fun to have a paper with metaphysics in the title, not because we're really going to be spending a lot of time on metaphysics, so don't worry. Um, and I'm going to start with the tale of four bakeries. So first bakery, Masterpiece Cake Shop in Lakewood, Colorado. In 2012, a gay couple, Charlie Craig and David Mullins, enter the bakery seeking to buy a cake for their wedding reception. Same-sex marriage is not yet legal in Colorado in 2012. They are going to get married in Massachusetts, come back to Colorado to celebrate with family and friends. As they're in the bakery flipping through a catalog full of pictures of wedding cakes that the bakery had done, the owner of the bake shop, Jack Phillips, who you see in that picture, comes over to them and says, how can I help you? They said, we'd like to buy a cake for our wedding. Mr. Phillips says, I'm really sorry. I can't provide you with a cake for a same-sex wedding. That would conflict with my religious beliefs. I'm happy to sell you other things in the store, birthday cake, cookies, cupcakes, what have you, but that I can't do. I'm really sorry. Couple leaves. The interaction between the baker and the couple 90 seconds, two minutes, I mean, a very short interaction. Don't discuss any details of the cake beyond that simple conversation. Charlie Craig and David Mullins file a complaint with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. In Colorado, it is uh, against the law to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. The commission finds the bakery liable for sexual orientation discrimination. The Colorado Court of Appeals agrees with the commission, and then the case works its way up to the US Supreme Court. Back in June of 2018, the Supreme Court issues a decision which rules in favor of the baker, but in a very weird way, which I will talk about in a moment, that doesn't really settle the interesting questions in the case. OK, so that's Masterpiece Cake Shop. Right around the time that the commission delivered its decision in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, a customer named William Jack, I know it's confusing, William Jack, Jack Phillips, I'm going to try to keep it clear. A customer named William Jack goes into a series of bakeries, including Azucar Bakery in Denver, Colorado, asks the, bakery, asks the baker, Marjorie Silva, for a cake that is in the shape of a Bible, and on one side, he wants Leviticus 18.22, homosexuality is a detestable sin. Leviticus 18.22 is man shall not lie with man as with woman is an abomination unto God. That's a lot to write on a cake. He paraphrases. Let's <laughs> paraphrase. Leviticus 18.22, homosexuality is a detestable sin. On the other side of the cake, he wants the image of two men with like a red circle and a line through it. The baker, Marjorie Silva, says, I'm sorry, I can't provide you with that cake. That would conflict with my moral beliefs. I believe in LGBT equality. Um, I'll sell you a Bible-shaped cake, because I mean, I sell those, so I'll, I'm happy to sell you one. I'll even give you like an icing bag so you can pipe whatever you want, like what you do when you leave the store, that's your business, fine. But I'm, I'm not going to do that design. William Jack, who was clearly there to make a point, because people don't really have homosexuality as a detestable sin, parties with cake. <laughs> files a complaint with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission to say, hey, this was discrimination on the basis of religion. The Colorado Civil Rights Commission says, no, this was about a particular message. William Jack's like, whoa, you know, if Jack Phillips has to support 
same-sex marriage and has to make a cake supporting same-sex marriage, why doesn't this baker have to make a cake uh, disapproving of same-sex marriage. It's a different message, and isn't this discrimination on the, you know, doesn't it violate free speech rights, et cetera, and so forth. And this was part of what factored into the decision at the Supreme Court for the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Third, and by the way, the, the, the God Hates Gays, so that, in a lot of the news reports had the, it was the God Hates Gays cake, but it didn't actually say that. It was, you know, the cake that I described, but this was the image from the news reports, so I'm sharing it with you. Take the cake bakery in Toledo, Ohio. In 2016, a customer enters the bakery. Um, her name is Candace. I can't remember her last name. She orders a birthday cake. After she leaves the store, the baker in that case, LaGresha Pfizer Brown, goes on the customer's Facebook page, realizes that the customer is a lesbian in a same-sex relationship and is actually buying the birthday cake for her lesbian partner, sends her a text message saying, Candace, I'm sorry, I just realized you're in a same-sex relationship and we do not do cakes for same-sex weddings or parties. I'm so sorry, I wasn't aware of this exactly until I saw your page. Take care, smiley face. <laughs> okay. So a few things about that case. First of all, put aside the weirdness about the Facebook page. But really, who does that? It's like, I'd like to buy a blueberry muffin. Great, first we're going to audit your Instagram. I mean, what is, I mean, who does? OK, but put that aside. The case was never litigated. All we know about the case, we know from news reports about the case, um, including this image, which apparently is a screenshot of the text exchange, which brings me to another point I want to make. It's a good thing that this case was never litigated, because in my own view, anyone who uses that font for text messages deserves to lose in court. That's just me. I'm not going to argue for that claim. I mean, it's like worse than Comic Sans. What is that? I mean, that's like people actually send text messages. But that's, that's an, apparently an image. What cancels the birthday cake order. A lot of people who supported Jack Phillips and said he should not have to make a wedding cake said, oh, no, 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 this is too far. We're not, you know, we don't want to turn gay people away from bakeries who want to just get to birthday cakes and, and thought that we could somehow draw a line there. But we're going to talk a little bit about that line drawing exercise. And finally, because I'm in Canada and I want to keep it international, <laughs> Asher's Bakery in the United Kingdom this is in Northern Ireland, uh, in, in uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. Customer going to a, an LGBT rights event wants a cake with Bert and Ernie on it with the message, support gay marriage, queer space, born 1998. So this was a, a design, very specific design they had in mind. Bakery said, no, 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 we cannot provide you with that cake. It conflicts with our beliefs. The district court and the court of appeals there found the bakery liable for sexual orientation discrimination and political discrimination, which is a category they have in the UK. We don't have typically in anti-discrimination laws in the United States. But in October 2018, the UK Supreme Court unanimously rules in favor of the bakery. So what I want to do this evening is mainly to talk about the Masterpiece Cake Shop case and use some of the other cases to shed some light on that case and some of the relevant issues and some of the places where we might want to draw lines there. And so the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to start by giving you some background uh, about that case that's relevant for the discussion. I'm then going to talk about a debate that happens in the concurring opinions between Justice Kagan and Justice Gorsuch. So the majority of opinion in many ways is not very interesting in this case, but the current concurring opinions have some interesting debates and, and, and I want to talk about that debate. Then I'm going to say a little bit about sexual orientation discrimination, a little bit about the metaphysics of cakes, and conclude with some lingering questions about the case. Okay, so Masterpiece Cake Shop. The relevant law here is Colorado's anti-discrimination law related to public accommodations. It says that a place of public accommodation cannot refuse, withhold from, or deny to an individual the full and equal enjoyment, 
of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations on the basis of race, color, disability, sex, sexual orientation, national origin, or ancestry, creed, or marital status. Colorado is an interesting state in that sexual orientation has been interpreted to include gender identity. Most places that want to include gender identity enumerate that separately. This is a pretty typical public accommodations law, except in the United States, fewer than half the states include sexual orientation discrimination in their public accommodations law, and it is not included in federal public accommodations law. That was one side of the case. It's like, okay, clearly the baker did not give these people the full and equal enjoyment of his bakery, but people said there's another relevant consideration here, which is the First Amendment of our Constitution, which says that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press and so on. The two relevant parts of the Constitution here were considered to be the free exercise clause and the free speech clause. And most people thought this is not really going to be about the free exercise cl clause because the Supreme Court had already decided in prior cases that just because your religion wants you to do something, that doesn't give you a kind of get out of the law free card. So there's a, a famous case, uh, 1990 Employment Division versus Smith, majority opinion written by Antonin Scalia, late justice, uh, where a Native American wants to use peyote as part of sacramental rituals and the court says, hey, the law against peyote that's not specifically targeting your religion, it's a law against a certain kind of drug use, um, and it, you know, it's a neutral, generally applicable law. You cannot use your free exercise rights as a way of exempting yourself from that law. So most people said they're not going like, to pay attention to the free exercise aspect of it, but the free speech aspect of it. You know, Masterpiece Cake Shop is called Masterpiece Cake Shop because Jack Phillips considers himself a cake artist. And he spends, I mean, it's very elaborate cake designs. And if any of you have ever bought a wedding cake, you know they can be quite elaborate, quite expensive, quite, quite detailed. And the idea was that Jack Phillips did not want to express a message by creating this cake, just as Marjorie Silva didn't want to create the homosexuality as a detestable sin cake, um, just as uh, these other bakers in these other cases did not want to express corresponding messages. So everyone expected this would be about the free speech stuff, not the free exercise stuff, and everyone was wrong. <laughs> in a very weird seven to two decision with only Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor dissenting, the court said, look, that free speech issue, that's really interesting, but there's a problem. Namely that when Jack Phillips went before the Colorado Human Rights Commission. A couple of the commissioners said things that weren't very nice about his religion. Specifically, one of them said that to use your religion to justify discrimination is the most despicable piece of rhetoric. And so Justice Kennedy, who writes the majority opinion, says to call somebody's religion the most despicable piece of rhetoric, it's like, actually, that's not what, what it says. It says to use your religion to justify discrimination is a despicable piece of rhetoric, but OK. Seven justices signed on to this. It's like Jack Phillips was not given a fair hearing because there was hostility toward his religious beliefs. And what's more, what the commission said in the Jack Phillips case seems inconsistent with what they're saying in the Azucar Bakery case, the Bible-shaped cake case. Because in that case, they say, look, nobody's going to think this is the baker's message. They're going to think it's the customer's message. So what does this have to do with messages? But in Jack Phillips' case, they like just, I'm sorry, in Jack Phillips' case, they said nobody's going to think it's the baker's message. It's the customer's message. In the other case, they said she shouldn't have to express this message. The baker shouldn't have to express this message. So there's some inconsistency in how they treat the cases. And so what the court ends up saying is that the court's precedents make it clear that the baker, in his capacity as the owner of a business serving the public, might have his right to the free exercise of religion limited by generally applicable laws. That's the Smith case I was mentioning to you. But whatever the outcome of some future controversy involving facts similar to these, the commission's actions here violated the free exercise clause and its order must be set aside. 
One commentator described this decision as a masterpiece of ducking the hard questions. <laughs> Basically, they kicked the can down the road, let some later court decide a later case like this. We're going to decide this case on the fact that they were mean to Jack Phillips, even though it's not really clear that they were mean to Jack Phillips. But interesting way to kick the can down the road, which the court did. So that was the majority opinion in the case. But as I mentioned, there is an interesting debate that goes on in the concurring opinion. So it, it's possible in these cases for justices to say, yeah, I agree with what the court said, but I want to add something. You know, let me step in and just add something else here. And several justices did that. Um, justice Kagan did it, joined by Justice Breyer. They were the two liberal justices who joined the majority, so people were kind of surprised by that. Um, so part of what they were doing there is to try to explain why. Uh, justice um, Gorsuch does this, jo joined by Justice Alito. And Justice Thomas does this on his own. I think he's joined by Alito and by Gorsuch as well. Uh, and then the dissent by Ginsburg and Sotomayor. But the debate between them is kind of interesting. So Justice Kagan says, in Justice Gorsuch's view, the Jack cases, that's the Bible cases, and the Phillips case must be treated the same because the bakers in all those cases would not sell the requested cakes to anyone. That description perfectly fits the Bible-shaped cases and explains why the bakers there did not engage in unlawful discrimination. But it's a surprising characterization of the masterpiece case, given that Jack Phillips routinely sells wedding cakes to opposite sex couples. Justice Gorsuch says, hang on. The bakers in Azucar, the, the, um, the Bible cake case, would have refused to sell a cake denigrating same-sex marriage to an atheist customer just as the baker and masterpiece would have refused to sell a cake celebrating same-sex marriage to a heterosexual customer. And the bakers in the first case were generally happy to sell to persons of faith, just as the baker in the second case was generally happy to sell to gay persons. Remember, Jack Phillips says, look, I'm happy to sell you birthday cakes and cupcakes and cookies and so on. In both cases, it was the kind of cake, not the kind of customer, that mattered to the bakers. Justice Kagan. This is, we're getting into the footnotes now. But that is wrong. <laughs> the cake requested was not a special cake celebrating same-sex marriage. It was simply a wedding cake, one that, like other standard wedding cakes, is suitable for use at same-sex and opposite-sex <laughs> weddings alike. Justice Gorsuch, why calibrate the level of generality in, in the masterpiece case at wedding cakes exactly and not say at cakes more generally? or cakes that convey a message regarding same-sex marriage more specifically. And he goes through this whole thing. This is where I get the title of the metaphysics of case. He's like, at one level, you know, it's just a mixture of flour and sugar and butter. <laughs> at a dare, you know, you, you, then you, you, you go up the scale, and no, it's very specific to this wedding. At this, so, so why calibrate here? Um, essentially, my talk tonight is going to be an answer to that question, why we should calibrate where um, I think we, the, the place where I think we should calibrate it, which is not quite at wedding cakes, but you'll see in a moment. So the question here comes down to what counts as the same cake? Both of these justices seem to agree that if a baker denies the same cake to gay people that he sells to straight people, he's discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation. That could be made a little bit more precise. Um, you know, if it, it just so happens that gay people show up on days when they're out of flour, and so he's denying cakes to those people. So, but, you know, but if he denies the same cake to gay people that, he deni that he's willing to offer to straight people, that at least is strong prima facie evidence that he's discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation. And certainly if he denies it to them because they're gay people, that would be discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And both justices seem to agree that that's true. But Justice Gorsuch says, he didn't deny the same cake to gay people that he sells to straight people. And the next two sections are going to be fleshing out why he thinks that. Um, there are two reasons. One is that he's not denying cakes to gay people. He's denying cakes for same-sex wedding celebrations, which is something different. So Colorado anti-discrimination law enumerates these various classifications the kind of wedding you're celebrating is not listed in the law. Sexual orientation is, but Jack Phillips doesn't care the sexual orientation of his customers. If a straight person came in and said, I want to buy a cake for a same-sex wedding, he'd say, no, I'm not going to sell you that cake. So he's not discriminating 
against gay people. He's not discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation. Call that the customer-focused uh, approach. The other argument that he gives is that it's not actually the same cake. Why? Well, because part of what makes a cake the distinctive thing it is is the message it sends. And cakes for same-sex weddings send a different message than cakes for heterosexual weddings. So he's not denying the same cakes to heterosexual customers as he is to gay customers. He's denying a specific kind of cake. It's about the kind of cake, not the kind of customer, to quote him again. OK, so the next two sections are about this. Section three, I'm going to go through pretty quickly. Section three is like, he's not denying the same cake to gay people. Why? Well, because, as I said, this is about refusing to do a cake for a same-sex wedding. And he underscores the fact, Justice Gorsuch underscores the fact, that Jack Phillips is happy to interact with gay people, to sell them birthday cakes, to sell them cupcakes, to sell them cookies. He's not a guy who discriminates on the basis of sexual orientation. So part of what I want to say in response to this is to point out that discriminating against a group of people doesn't mean you have to completely avoid that group of people, doesn't mean you have to refuse any interaction with them, doesn't mean that you have to discriminate against them in every possible opportunity. Take sort of classic cases of unjust discrimination. Take race discrimination in the Old South in the United States. Racists in the Old South in the United States interacted with people of color in a variety of different ways, sometimes in very intimate ways. They'd have them as nannies, wet nurses for their children. It wasn't about completely avoiding the group. It was about keeping the group within a certain place. It was about certain boundaries around what that group could and could not do. Now, in the case of sexual orientation discrimination, there are certain boundaries. What are those boundaries? Well, they have to do with having relationships, expressing those relationships, getting married. To tell people that they have to stay within those lines is sexual orientation discrimination and can be sexual orientation discrimination even if you're happy to sell these people cookies. To make the point more general here, there are certain kinds of activities that are closely enough tied with certain kinds of identities that to discriminate with respect to the activity is clearly to discriminate with respect to the identity. So to quote the late Justice Scalia in a very different kind of case, he said, a tax on wearing yarmulkes is a tax on Jews. Now, not all Jewish men wear yarmulkes. Not only Jewish men wear yarmulkes. But if we have a tax on wearing yarmulkes, that would clearly be a tax on Jews. Why? Because that is such a direct expression of a person's religious faith. Similarly, to discriminate with respect to same-sex weddings is to discriminate against gay people. Even though you can imagine cases where straight people want to buy a cake for a gay wedding, even though you can imagine cases where you know, gay people don't care about buying a cake for their wife. There, there are all kinds of ways you can line it up. But the identity and the activity are closely enough tied there that it's a distinction without a difference. Now, there are going to be some cases where it's hard to really determine whether the activity and the identity are really closely tied or whether they're just incidental to each other. This is not one of those hard cases. I want to spend the bulk of my time on his other approach to the argument, Gorsuch's other approach to the argument, that Jack Phillips did not deny the same cake to gay people, saying that he did not deny the same cake to gay people because gay wedding cakes are just not a thing that Jack Phillips provides. Now, Jack Phillips pointed out during arguments for the case that there are lots of kinds of cakes that he will not sell. Jack Phillips will not make cakes for Halloween. He thinks Halloween is of Satan or something like that. Jack Phillips will not make lewd bachelor party cakes. Jack Phillips once refused to uh, accept an order for a divorce cake. Somebody wanted to celebrate their divorce. They wanted a cake in the shape of a wedding cake, but split in two. <laughs> True story. Jack Phillips said, no, I will not provide those cakes and Gay wedding cakes are among the cakes that I will not provide, to which the simple and most 
straightforward answer is gay wedding cakes are not a thing. Gay wedding cakes, gay people order their cakes from the same catalogs as everyone else. This is the kind of point that Justice Kagan was trying to make. And in saying that, I'm, I'm by the way, to just come clean on the title of the talk, I'm not making a metaphysical claim here. Um, how we divide up wedding cakes for the purposes of anti-discrimination law is an ethical question and a political question. But to say more about why the relevant category here is not gay wedding cake, let me go back to comparing Jack Phillips' case and Masterpiece and Marjorie Silva and Azucar Bakery. That is actually Marjorie Silva with a cake that she made that says, stop the hate, don't discriminate. A little heart on it, very sweet. <laughs> See, she, she's not the kind of person who wants to make a cake that says homosexuality is a detestable sin. She's just a happy, kind of friendly person. Um, so, lots of people on Jack Phillips' side would observe the two cases and say, just as she did not want to make a cake denigrating same-sex marriage, he did not want to make a cake supporting same-sex marriage. They are flip sides of each other. But no, they're not, actually, because remember, Marjorie Silva told the customer that she would happily sell him a Bible-shaped cake, because that's something she sells in her store. She was even willing to give him an icing bag so he could write what he wanted on it. She would sell him the same cake she would sell to any other customer, whereas Jack Phillips would not sell any cake for a same-sex wedding. Never discussed designs with the customers. In fact, there was a, an earlier case that just came out during the, the trial where they had refused a cupcake order for people celebrating a same-sex wedding. I want to draw attention to a distinction here, which I'm going to call the distinction between design-based refusals and use-based refusals. It's one thing to say, look, I'm not going to do a particular kind of design, like a Halloween pumpkin cake, or a penis-shaped cake, or a swastika cake, or, or something like that. It's another thing to say, look, I sell this design, but I'm not going to sell it to you for this purpose. This distinction actually comports with a lot of what we normally think about appropriate boundaries for what businesses may refuse to sell or not refuse to sell. So we don't think like, a vegan bakery should be forced to sell cakes with real buttercream. Gluten-free bakery should be forced to sell cakes made with wheat. Kosher bakery should be forced to sell cakes with candied bacon on top. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that, that Businesses generally have wide latitude over what they sell. They don't generally have wide latitude over what you do with it once you leave the store. Take a different example. Suppose I have a fabric shop where I make very beautiful silk screened fabrics and I do all different kinds of designs and you can come in and pick what kind of material you want, what kind of color you want, what kind of design you want, and so on. It would be one thing if you brought me a design and I said, no, I don't want to do that design. I, you know, I think that that design is obscene. Maybe it has like Donald Trump's face on it or something. <laughs> it would be another thing if I happily sold this, sold this design to a bunch of people, but I said, wait, you're a Muslim who wants to use it for a hijab? No, I'm, I'm not going to sell you that. The former case would be a design-based refusal. The latter case would be a use-based use refusal, and it would be a use-based refusal that would be closely enough tied with a person's religious identity that to discriminate against that use would be to discriminate against that particular class of people. The masterpiece case was use-based, the Azucar case, design-based refusal. Now, Compare the Asher's Bakery case from Northern Ireland. Remember, that's a unanimous decision on the part of that court. I think that court got that one right. I think that a good way to sort of draw the lines on free speech is to say, look, if there's a particular design you don't want to sell, you shouldn't have to sell that design. It's quite a different thing to say, I sell a design, but I'm not going to sell it to these people for this use. But that brings us back to Justice Gorsuch's question. The way he asked the question, he's like, why calibrate at wedding cakes? Why not calibrate more generally at cakes or more specifically at cakes celebrating this particular kind of marriage? Now, I actually think that that's the wrong way to ask the question. Because 
look, as far as we know, for all we know, um, Charlie Craig and David Mullins, the cake they wanted might have looked nothing like a traditional wedding cake. It might not have been identifiable as a wedding cake apart from its use. I'm not trying to calibrate at wedding cakes. I'm trying to calibrate at specific designs, and by design I mean the shape, the size, the color, the ingredients, and so on, intrinsic factors to the cake, not extrinsic factors such as where is this cake going to show up? What kind of party is it going to? But let's ask that question. Why not differentiate cakes by where they're going to eventually show up? And the quick and compelling answer to that question is that if we start doing that, we pretty much gut anti-discrimination law of any meaning or force. First of all, if you start to say that it's a different kind of cake if it's for a same-sex wedding than for a different sex wedding, there's no reason to think that we're going to be able to limit that to the issue of homosexuality. Suppose I'm a racist baker. I don't believe in interracial marriage. I say, look, I happily sell items to a people of a wide variety of races, you know, birthday cakes, cupcakes, cookies. I'll even sell them wedding cakes as long as they're for a same race marriage but not for a different race marriage. If we start differentiating the kind of cake by where the cake is going to end up, Justice Gorsuch could say, well, it's the kind of cake, cake for an interracial wedding, not the kind of customer that matters here. And that clearly seems to be wrong. Nor can we limit this to wedding cakes. Suppose I am a nasty homophobe. You know, Jack Phillips, he's happy to sell lots of things to gay people. I'm, I'm, I'm not that happy to sell things to gay people. In fact, I want to make it clear that gay lives don't matter. You come in, a gay person, wanting a birthday cake. I say, well, birthday cakes send a message. The message is that your life is worth honoring and celebrating. I don't believe that. I don't want to send that message. If this birthday cake that I'm selling is going to end up at a gay birthday party, then I shouldn't have to sell it because I don't sell that kind of cake. It's the kind of cake, not the kind of customer that matters. You say, nobody would do that for wedding cakes. Ah, remember that bakery in Toledo, Ohio? <laughs> Actually, people would do that for birthday cakes. And if they could do it you know, because they're anti-gay, they could do it because they're racist, they could do it because of re religious bigotry, and so forth. Nor is it entirely clear that it would matter that this is a custom, we a, lot, a lot of emphasis was put on custom wedding cakes. And just, well, you know, wedding cakes are generally ordered in advance. You don't want to have like these big wedding cakes sitting around your store because maybe nobody's getting married this weekend and then you've got a big wedding cake stuck in the refrigerator. What are you going to do with it? Um, so wedding cakes are generally pre-ordered and so a lot of them are custom wedding cake, custom wedding cake. But look, if we differentiate by where the cake is going to show up, an off-the-shelf birthday cake, you could say the same thing. Well, if this is going to a gay birthday party, this is going to a same-sex wedding party, so well, no, that's not a thing I sell. So there are a lot of good reasons to draw the line at design uh, rather than use. And if all of these arguments sound vaguely familiar, it's because we've heard something like them before. This is... Maurice Bessinger of Piggy Park Barbecues in the 1960s, he ran afoul of public accommodations law because he would not serve black people at his barbecue joints. He was happy to sell them takeout barbecue out of the, the back door of his barbecue joints. He's like, happy to sell, happy to interact with, with people. You know, just, no problem with that. But I don't believe, he said, in interracial dining. I think the integration of the races is wrong. I have religious reasons for believing that pointed to various Bible passages saying that, and it would be a violation not only of my free exercise rights, but also of my free speech rights. Because if I'm going to serve to people of different races in the same dining room, that's forcing me to say something, namely that I approve of this kind of integrated dining, and I don't. And when he said that in, back in the 1960s, the court said that that's a facetious argument. They wouldn't even take it seriously. To conclude, there are some 
interesting and challenging questions that arise from this case. I say that we should distinguish by design, but we might be able to find interesting cases about what counts as the same design. Does it matter if it has writing on it or not? Does it matter if it's custom or pre-ordered? Again, Jack Phillips made a lot of that issue, but it's not really clear why that matters to the free speech argument or the other arguments that he put forth. I've drawn a line between design-based refusals and use-based refusals, but we could imagine cases where use-based refusals are morally acceptable. For example, some pharmaceutical companies refuse to sell drugs for lethal injection to prisons because they don't believe in lethal injection, even though they would sell the same drugs for use in other contexts for other things. Um, that's a use-based objection, but it's one that many people want to morally protect. So that's another question about drawing the line there that we might explore. And finally, how do we distinguish messages that are integral to a person's protected status and those that are merely incidental to it? As I acknowledged earlier, that can be a very hard question, but I don't think it was a hard question in this particular case. And so not just a masterpiece of ducking the hard questions, I think in this case, the Supreme Court ducked a pretty easy question and kicked the can down the road, and we can do better. Thanks very much. And now we're going to open for questions, and I'm going to hand this microphone over, and I'm going to stand at that microphone, right? Yes, OK. So I, I have two questions of clarification. OK. So when you're talking about the use-based versus the design-based, then you're saying it is OK not to sell a Halloween cake if you sell a Halloween cake to nobody. Um, and so under, under what you're arguing, then that is legitimate. And then the second sort of thing is, under use-based, so I'm trying to think of here, what is an example that would tick off um, left-wing people, but still would be acceptable? So like, I'm going to use, I'm, I want a cake for my party that's going to be a white supremacy party. Then that should then, under this, be allowed? So a couple things. Um, one is that I don't want to make as broad a, of a claim as it would be okay to um, refuse in those kinds of cases. Remind me of the first case you mentioned, because I, I... Halloween cake. Halloween cake, yeah. So I don't want to... It, it would be okay is, is very broad. What I'm suggesting here is that a, as a way of balancing free speech protections and anti-discrimination protections in the United States, as a way of sort of making those things coexist peacefully, balance may not be the right metaphor there, um, that I think that this is a good place to draw the line. And I recognize that by drawing the line in this way, it's going to mean that it will be legally permissible for me to say, look, I just don't shell, sell cakes in, in typical Halloween shapes. I won't do like a, a jack-o'-lantern cake, for example. Now, that may um, also mean that I'm a bakery and I do cross-shaped cakes that people use for First Holy Communions or confirmations and so on, and somebody comes in and says, can I have a Star of David cake? And I am saying, no, I'm sorry, I don't sell those. Um, and yes, on the proposal that I'm putting forth, that would be legally permissible, and I could see how some people would find that um, an unpleasant um, bullet to bite. But I do think that it's the same um, free speech rights that allow Marjorie Silva not to make the homosexuality as a detestable sin cake, the same free speech rights that allows somebody to refuse um, to do a Make America Great Again Trump cake to, I mean, even to take it further to, to make a swastika cake uh, that allows a person to say, look, that's just not a shape or design that I sell in the shop. And yeah, I, I would want to draw the line there, even though it might result in some cases where bakers make decisions that I think are immoral. My question is uh, hopefully a quick and easy one. I just would like to invite you to uh, take a stab at some, and answer to one of your lingering questions. And I'm curious about um, when use-based refusals are 
acceptable, and in particular the case that you talked about with the um, or with the uh, drug companies refusing to sell um, drugs for lethal injections. And I'm just curious, like, how do you think that might play out? There? That's it. So, one of the things that I believe is that it's often not a simple rule that's going to generate um, where to draw the lines in these cases. And there are going to be some issues, particularly life and death kinds of issues, uh, where more comes into play. Um, for example, so, so it, it's one reason why I think that conscientious exceptions uh, in case of military service um, get stronger weight than in cases that don't involve potentially life or death things, and certainly the um, use of drugs for death penalty would be one of them. I still have come up with sort of hypotheticals that I don't know quite what to do with. So um, suppose I'm a chicken farmer and I sell chickens. You come to me and you're of the Santorian faith. Santorians, um, and you do chicken sacrifice as part of their religious rituals. I'm like, I don't want to sell chickens for that, although I'm happy to sell it if you're going to, to make a chicken dinner tonight. Um, that seems to me to be discrimination on the basis of religion, but I could also see why some people's intuitions uh, might um, uh, uh, go in the other direction from mine there. And, you know, take a, a vegetarian, take a, no, not a vegetarian, um, well, um, an ovo-lacto vegetarian who's just like, I, I'm, 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 selling, I'm selling them if you're, if you're going to use them for their eggs, but not if you're going to, you know, make them into cocoa van. Um, uh, I think those are harder cases. Yeah. And, I, and I don't know what further to say there. Thanks so much for the, uh, for the second talk. Just as good as the talk yesterday. Um, I'm wondering, so, so I, 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 I was teaching the philosophy of law last summer when the case came out in June. Mm -hmm. And we spent a couple of lectures talking about the case. Uh, and the consensus my students had, and I think I agreed with them at the time, I'm not sure if I still agree with them, but I've got leanings this way, is basically that the Supreme Court didn't have much of a choice because of the way that the commission dealt with the two cases. Um, so you were talking about kicking the can, and in particular kicking the can on the easy stuff. Um, I'm just wondering how much you think of the case could have been decided differently given what the commission did, given that they were sort of ham-handed in their justifications of the, uh, uh, of the you know, uh, 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 homosexuality is a detestable sin case and, 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 and the uh, Phillips case. So I go back and forth between thinking that Kagan got it right and thinking that Ginsburg got it right. So Ginsburg basically says, look, Maybe um, some commissioner, one commissioner, one commissioner, not some commissioners, so there's a whole panel of commissioners, one commissioner makes some sort of intemperate remarks about, but they're not even that intemperate. You know, using your religion to discriminate, that's a despicable piece of rhetoric. Okay, I mean, that's, you know. So, um, and maybe the commission was kind of ham-handed, ham but we can look at this case on the merits, and on the merits, he deserves to lose. Um, Kagan says, uh, they were ham-handed, but had they not been ham-handed, they, they could have distinguished the cases very e easily. And what I'm trying to do is to like, help Kagan, because she does most of this in like a footnote, <laughs> and to say, look, here, here's, a, here's a whole uh, you know, further argument about how we can you know, distinguish design-based versus use-based refusals and distinguish the cases that way. Um, so I don't know if I'd go as far as to say that the, the court had no choice given how ham-handed the commission was. The court often deals with ham-handed lower courts and, and will sometimes um, repair their arguments before, before making their decision. Yeah. Just because some of the students are here, they agree with Kagan, by the way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> one, one worry I have about the use-based distinction, though, is um, along gender lines, the pharmacist refusing to sell um, uh, uh, prescription um, contraceptives uh, and certainly not uh, wanting to have uh, the compounds be formulated into abortion pill um, prescriptions and that sort of thing. Is that another bullet we'll have to bite? It, it, like it... No. 
So look, I think that there can be very, for, first of all, I don't think that's a case where we really have to balance free speech kinds of considerations. Um, you could talk more generally about the freedom of the pharmacist, but I think it's quite appropriate in licensing doctors and pharmacists and so on to have certain requirements about the range of services they need to provide if they want to take on that particular profession. And there may be some cases where we can create carve-outs uh, as long as we're sure that people still, I mean, you know, if, if, if there are six pharmacists working in the same pharmacy and one of them doesn't want to distribute contraceptives, it's not really a huge deal for another pharmacist to come up, but that's often not the case in, in small towns and so on. So, so I, I don't think we have to, to bite the bullet on that. I think that we can handle that um, with, with other laws for, for, you know, passed for other reasons, namely the reason uh, having to do with the importance of access to health care. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things I don't spend a lot of time on in the book, but it is an issue that I wish I could have spent more time on, is that the issue of religious hospitals. Uh, in the United States, at least, and I imagine it's probably true, maybe even more true here, that Catholic hospital systems often function as a kind of monopoly within particular towns. So it's like you, you really, I mean, it's not like you can go to this hospital or this hospital. No, like this is the hospital system, and you're going to go to it or not go to the hospital. Um, and when they do function as a kind of monopoly, uh, like that, I think that it's appropriate for us to, to regulate um, in that way. Hey, Nancy, first, what a wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a long day, so it's nice to laugh. <laughs> hey, so um, wonderful job. Uh, and then I have not been following uh, the Marjorie case. I had heard of the other ones. Um, so forgive me if I'm a bit in the dark on some of the details, but I'm curious um, if ever the defense came up about her choosing not to write such a statement because I believe that would be defamation and she could be charged or labelled for uh, hate speech. So in the other cases, it is a negative, like uh, it's the absence of doing something. And in her case, the customer is requesting that she participate in hateful commentary. Um, and for that reason, I imagine that she would have a pretty strong defense to say, this isn't just about my beliefs, you are incurring me to participate in a way that is very staunchly and clearly inappropriate um, because we would not allow a teacher or school children to say something like that. We would not necessarily publish it in the same kind of journalistic freedoms that we might expect of uh, news outlets. So I'm curious if that came up. Um, but maybe it has. Um, it, it didn't really, and the reason it didn't really is that hate speech is not against the law in the United States. Mm -hmm. So. Ameri Ameri yeah, yeah. So, so, so that partic particular places of business, universities, and so on may have speech codes, but given the First Amendment, given what a strong free speech kind of place we are, uh, that that is not a legal category that 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 was operative here, and you know, the idea is, I mean, to to, to try to sort of get it from the other side and, and to, to sort of appreciate the position of the other side here. You know, for Jack Phillips to celebrate and encourage same-sex marriage, to him that, you know, is expressing something just as immoral and awful as it is for Marjorie Silva to, to say homosexuality is a detestable sin. And in both cases, the person genuinely believes that this is an immoral act that you know that makes them complicit in something evil, and the state just does not want to get involved in sort of deciding which one of them is, is right on that. It wants to give them the freedom to hash out that debate amongst themselves. So that's that's the basic idea behind why we say, look, why we in the United States can't distinguish the cases by saying, well, one of those things is hateful and, and, or, and evil and one of them isn't. It's like, no, it, that's up to the individuals to decide what they want to say and how they want to say it. Yeah. Well, 
well, and maybe they were hostile towards him. It did go up through several levels before it got to the U.S. Supreme Court. So do none of those levels count as being fair trials? So this was one of the points that Ginsburg made. So it wasn't just one commissioner, it was a whole commission, and then it went up you know, through the Colorado Court of Appeals. So Jack Phillips had plenty of opportunity to have a fair hearing, uh, and which is why she thought it was silly to suggest that just because one commissioner back at one level made this remark uh, that we, we threw. And you know, the other weird thing about this is that normally in cases where a commission screws up, the court remands it back and says, okay, now do this over and do it right this time. This time they just held in favor of the baker. Uh, the idea was, look, he's been through enough, we're gonna just reversed, done. Um, which, which also suggests that they just really wanted to wash their hands of the whole thing. They did not want it coming back again. Yeah. 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 Thank you. This is really wonderful and provocative. Uh, I'm wondering about where this would sit in terms of design base. So say there is some uh, newspaper or something like that that pr um, prints um, wedding announcements or other kind of announcements. And uh, the person is trans, uh, one of the individuals is trans, and they want to use um, non-binary pronouns, like they mm -hmm. Um, and the person refuses that because they don't believe in their gender, they believe in gender binary. Mm -hmm. um, would that be discrimination on design? Yes. It would seem so, but then the question becomes um, whether we treat the newspaper as a kind of public accommodation or whether it's, I mean, newspapers are weird because they're sort of quasi-public kinds of things, right? I mean, it's not like, you know, just, I, I publish my own little journal and I say what I want and if you don't like it, you don't have to order it. I mean, if, 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 I'm, I'm, if I'm the the newspaper in town and I print the wedding announcements, um, excluding somebody from that becomes a greater deprivation. So, you know, I, I do think that generally speaking, um, if, if I don't want to print and acknowledge, I mean, just, you know, for the same reason I think that the newspaper doesn't have to, you know, print an announcement of the Richard Spencer rally, that they shouldn't have to print an announcement of my wedding if they don't have to, but, you know, if you're, you know, the only newspaper in town and this is where the wedding announcements go, I could see how somebody would make an argument in the other direction, uh, and certainly in the case that you described. So this case, you know, up until it got to the Supreme Court had been decided in favor of the customer. Uh, the Colorado Court of Appeals decided in favor of the customer. There is a case in Oregon, which may be working its way up to the Supreme Court now, um, where it was Sweet Cakes by Melissa is the name of the bakery. And uh, the customer, Rachel Bowman Cryer, came in to order a wedding cake and was, was told that she could not do so. Um, that case is, is, is sort of interesting, partly because the customer had a deeply emotional reaction to all this. She, she left the store crying. It, it became a, um, then she, the mother went back in, and so it became a kind of a, a big interaction, uh, but also because um, that emotional distress led to a huge fine against the bakery, something like 130 something thousand dollar fine. Um, so, um, but, uh, but thus far that, that has been ruled in favor, favor of the customer, not the baker. We'll see what happens when it gets, um, when and if it gets to the Supreme Court. My, my own view is that the Supreme Court would just, as soon, it would just as soon put off these kinds of cases, although we have a different Supreme Court now than the one that decided this one. Kennedy is no longer on the court and he's been placed, replaced with someone very much to his right. I do think it makes a difference when instead of saying I'm selling something and you're going to take it somewhere and do something with it, that I actually have to be there and participating, which is one reason why I think that photography cases should be treated differently than cake cases. Also because we typically recognize photography 
as an art form, and so the argument for treating this as art and thus as speech is stronger than in the case of cake. I don't deny, by the way, that wedding cakes are very artistic, but I don't think they should be treated as artistic speech for the purpose of, uh, of these kinds of disputes. Again, because you know, typically you have somebody picking out things from a catalog. If you've ever ordered a wedding cake, and in the first slide I had a picture of my wedding cake, um, you go in, you tell them like, you know, how many tiers you want, you know, you know, what kind of filling, what kind of icing, what kind of cake flavor, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of design on the frosting. I mean, you, you, you're picking, generally speaking, from a um, limited set of designs. It's unlike, you know, I, I go to a, a portrait artist and say, hey, I you know, do my portrait, and, um, and, and they go do their artistic thing. So, so I do think that the more artistic you get, the, the stronger the free speech case is going to be on the part of the provider. Um, I don't think that um, that was a particularly strong argument here. It's an interesting question because I used to do some work in business ethics and it's been a long time since I have. I mean, most of the, well, I say most, a lot of the cases in business ethics come up when businesses want to do something that's very profitable but morally questionable. It's not profitable generally to turn people away from your bakery, right? So, uh, you know, I mean, maybe if you live in a conservative enough town and, you know, people know that you're, you're the bakery that serves the gay com customers, then you lose the, 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 the conservative customers. You know, just like, you know, I mean, uh, in, in, you know, racist parts of the Old South, were it not for public accommodations laws, it would have been very profitable for people to continue to remain se segregated because those that tried to integrate were sort of abandoned by the majority. Um, but this is, I mean, because I, maybe, the re, maybe the reason that I never thought of this in a, within a business ethics framework is it doesn't fit that framework of here's something profitable but more, morally questionable. Yeah. yeah. Which maybe is a bad way to think about business ethics. <laughs> but. I want to ask a question as an inter, at the intersection of the art question and the business ethics question. Okay. I noticed that when you shifted from the Cold War to the Post-Cold War, to uh, use-based models, um, you started to shift away from talking about artisans' work. You gave an example of a chicken farmer and a pharmaceutical manufacturer and so forth. Um, and so it occurs to me that the use-based model is one then that um, has a much wider scope because it could involve not only manufacturers, wide-scale manufacturers, not just artisanal ones, but also wholesalers and resellers and so forth. Is that a problem because it lets too much in, or is that strength of the model that allows us to analyze so many more kinds of cases? So I don't want to frame what I did as moving from one model to another. Rather, there's a way of sort of drawing the line at design-based refusals, uh, which is different from these other use-based refusals. And the design-based refusals, um, I mean, you, some of the examples I gave for use-based refusals also involved artisans. So, like the, the silkscreen, you know, fabric uh, store, uh, you know, person who makes these beautiful fabrics, who says, "Look, I, you know, I'm happy, I'm happy to sell veils, but or, or headscarves, but not hijabs." It's, like, it's the same thing. It's like, no, it's not. It, you know, it's the kind of it's the kind of fabric, not the kind of customer that matters. It, you, no, all right. So, so, so yeah. So I, I, I so I wouldn't want to sort of compare the strength of one model or the other as opposed to saying, is this a good place to draw the line for these kinds of cases or, or, or not? So you said this is set to get uh, brought back because they flagged that it was a special decision that the Supreme Court made. Do you hope you get cited in the footnotes? <laughs> you, you know, know it's, it, it, it's really funny because I, I had thought about filing a brief in this case. My counterpoint authors, Sharif Gurgis and Ryan Anderson, both did. I've never fi filed a brief in a Supreme Court case. There were a, there were a lot of briefs in this case. Um, and I do think that this particular line drawing uh, thing would have been useful, um, whether, you know, 
it would have meant instead of just burying everything in a footnote, Kagan would have done even more with it. I don't know. Um, but if, if a case like this comes before the court again, I, I think I would, in fact, file a brief suggesting this distinction. I did um, make this distinction in, in an op-ed in the New York Times, thinking it's probably some of the clerks at least read the New York Times, even if the justices don't see it. But, but you know, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, it's interesting to think about it in the salon case, because if I walk in and say I want the same haircut as you know you just gave the last guy, it's like I can't give you the same haircut. You have curly hair, they had straight hair. Um, I don't know if the model sort of carries over to that. My, the worry I have, it's not a huge worry, um, is that a person can say, well, look, I will sell you a cake for your wedding, but I'm not writing congratulations, Charlie and David, on it. It's like, really? Um, and, and, and then what do you do with, 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 with cases where, you know, so a heterosexual comes in, a couple comes in and says, you know, I want congratulations, Glenn and Stacy, and then they do that. And then a gay couple named Glenn and Stacy, either two men or two women, because <laughs> those names can both, both, both go both ways, uh, say, I want the same cake the last people got. It's like, what? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, 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 um, yeah, I mean, some of the bakers might get creative, but, w but the main thing I want to do is avoid these situations where people walk into a bakery, they're flipping through a beautiful catalog, and they're told, no, those aren't for you, um, which is what, what happened in this case. I mean, we, we t people tend to minimize this, and, and I get why they do it. I mean, there have been times where I've been inclined to do it. You know, my worry is that we spend so much time talking about these cases that people start to think that the worst thing, you know, the worst problem facing LGBT people is we can't buy cakes and flowers. It's like, really? <laughs> This, this is how you spend your time? Um, uh, but, but, but of course, it's not ultimately about cakes and flowers. It's about being able to go into the public square and you know, receive equal treatment in these places of public business. And you know, to be told, especially against a backdrop where you may have you know, been rejected by family, friends, church, whatever, uh, that you know, yeah, those are beautiful cakes, and we sell those here, but not to you. Um, is demeaning in, 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 in an often a very painful way. So that, that's what I'm concerned about. And in the, these sort of little details of, well, I'm not going to write congratulations, Charlie and David, uh, I'm not at, 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 as worried about. But who knows? Maybe people will come up with creative things that get me worried again. Hey, how's it going? I'm bad with microphones, so I'm going to apologize. So I'm curious if there might be a case, actually, in which use based discrimination could be warranted. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking specifically, say, I'm a baker, and some a group of fascists come into my store. Yeah. And I just have a cake on display, and they go, we'll take that cake. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, I'm not going to sell to you. You're a bunch of filthy fascists. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm thinking, to tie it to your talk yesterday, and I'm sorry to those of you who were at the talk yesterday, I'm thinking that I would be warranted because I wouldn't be bigoted, and that my contempt would be justified for fascists. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the other case, let's say if I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to sell you that cake, that's on display right there because I don't want it to go towards uh, the purpose of celebrating a gay marriage, that would be bigoted, and that such would be unwarranted for that reason. I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, so I have good news and bad news. <laughs> the good news is that because typical U.S. anti-discrimination law does not include political beliefs among the enumerated categories, I'm allowed to discriminate on the basis of people you know, affiliating with fascist political movements uh, uh, because there's, that's not, a, not in violation of anti-discrimination law. The bad news is, is that you can rearrange the case. Um, you know, so it's the Westboro Baptist Church. Those are the God hates fags people. They, 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 they want, want the cake for their annual jamboree, and they could come in, I want that cake. And um, I'm just inclined to bite the bullet there and so just sell them the cake, you know, whatever. Wasn't across the entire United States, no, just in. Um, do you think that would have changed the outcome of the case if it had occurred after the US Supreme Court decision to legalize same sex marriage? 
The court makes reference to this. Uh, the court says, look, uh, Kennedy, writing for the majority, says, it's not that surprising to think that Jack Phillips might not be sure what to do here, uh, particularly given that it's, you know, same-sex marriage is not even yet legal in the state of Colorado, and the Obergefell decision had not yet been handed down. That was the decision that, you know, by the Supreme Court that legalized it across the United States, where we said, hey, to you know, re refuse marriage to same-sex couples is to, is to demean them and to violate their, their rights. So, so the court thought that that might be relevant, but they didn't really specify quite how relevant it was. Okay, so 